Good afternoon, and thank you for joining us for another session of Chats with the Chief of Belonging Dialogue. My name is Dwayne Reynolds, and I'm the founder and CEO of Just Health Collective. We are a professional services and advisory firm focused on accelerating health equity and belonging in health and healthcare. Thrilled to have you with us today. And uh, if you're so inclined, please feel free to click sh the share icon at the bottom of your screen uh, to allow others to share in this important conversation uh, within your network. We wanna give everyone the opportunity to join in and benefit from hearing leaders discuss health equity and belonging. We'll leave a bit of time to answer your questions uh, at, at the end and maybe even some throughout. So feel free to post them in the chat as they come to you. Today's conversation is about mentoring and about women in leadership. According to Forbes, only 37, 37 or just 7.4% of the Fortune 500 company CEOs today are women despite the fact that women are indeed half of the population. Additionally, out of the 1.1 million people who left the workforce in September 2020 due to the pandemic, roughly 865,000 or 79% of them were women. This leads many of us to wonder what will happen to growth of women in leadership in future years and how can current leaders support women in the workplace? Now I'd like to introduce today's guest, Dr. Melanie Ho. Melanie is a distinguished author who recently wrote a business book titled Beyond Leaning In, Gender Equity and What Organizations Are Up Against. She is also the founder of Strategic Imagination, a firm dedicated to drawing on the power of the imaginative arts to drive transformational change. She previously served as vice president of uh, EAB, Education Advisory Board Global, and she was an Education Advisor, uh, I'm sorry, Education Advisory Board Global, which is an Education Advisory Technology and Services firm. And Melanie has also volunteered for many political campaigns, including serving as the lead organizer for GOTV rallies in Los Angeles for presidential, gubernatorial, and U.S. Senate races. She holds a PhD in English from UCLA and received the school's Distinguished Teaching Award for Innovative Approaches to Experiential Education and Teaching with Technology. Welcome, Melanie. Great to see you. Good to see you. This is my first LinkedIn Live, so I'm really excited. It is a really cool forum. Uh, we've probably done about four now, so I think you're my fourth or fifth guest, but we are excited about uh, this particular medium. Um, a, a great new way to connect with people in the professional mm -hmm. space. So um, you're passionate about supporting women leaders, and that's really evident by the book that you wrote. Can you explain what you mean by Beyond Leaning In for Women Leaders, and why is this such an important initiative today? Sure. Well, let me trace it back to 2013 when Sheryl Sandberg first published Lean In. I'll first start by saying that even though I wrote a book called Beyond Leaning In, I absolutely love Lean In. I think it's such an important contribution to the field. And when I think about Sheryl Sandberg's TED Talk that was popular before Lean In, where she talks about how women need to take their seat at the table and raise their hands, I know so many women who have been inspired by that, who even went and asked for raises, watching that to uh, really cheer them on. When Lean In came out, then at first I was really excited because I thought, well, here's a book by a Facebook executive about gender in the workforce. And this means that there will be a national discourse that there wasn't before. And that was true to some extent. People were talking about Lean In, they were reading Lean In. The problem is, I think it went a little bit too far. Mm -hmm. I think that employers and organizations often are so busy that they're looking for solutions that can be distilled into a soundbite or can be distilled into a few bullet points on the slide. And Lean In is exactly that. It's two words. And so we got to a point, I think, as many organizations where it felt like Lean In became a shorthand for the mm -hmm. only problem that we needed to solve when it came to gender equity was that women weren't raising their hands, that they weren't confident or that they were um, balancing conflicting priorities. And then it felt like that was putting all of the onus on women, that it was our problem yeah. to solve. Right. 
And that is so often the case that um, marginalized folks are typically the ones asked to solve uh, the issues with diversity, equity, and inclusion. Um, and the reality is we certainly can provide a lived experience, but we shouldn't always be the ones who are trying to solve uh, these issues that we don't often, we, we really don't create. Exactly. Yeah, they're, they're systemic and they're cultural issues. That's right. That's right. So uh, in thinking about that, uh, what's your definition of modern leadership? What does it look like? Yeah, I think a lot about just all of the changes that we have around us that mean that organizations and leaders can't do business the way that they were in the past. And some of that is just the fast pace of change, right? Whether it's technology or regulatory issues or what have you. Some of that is generational shifts. Some of that is just about what work looks like in a more global environment and a more distributed environment and one where top-down hierarchy doesn't work. And what, a lot of what I talk about in Beyond Leaning In is that the idea of lean in kind of presupposes this idea that it's stereotypically masculine traits that are needed in the workforce when they're constantly being told to be, say, more assertive. Rather than saying whether some of those stereotypically feminine traits like empathy or cross-cultural communication or a certain type of flexibility that this modern environment that we're in really demands. Yeah, and you know, I think about um, the impact that the pandemic has had on women mm -hmm. in the workforce. It really does uh, make you wonder if there's going to be yet another pipeline issue because uh, we've had so many women who, who've had to uh, leave the workforce, yet women probably have the better skill set to lead in our current day and age. Uh, and so, you know, I think that's something that organizations are really going to have to be attuned to as mm -hmm. they think about their recruitment development pipeline strategies moving forward. Yeah, I think so, it's an interesting reckoning moment. Oh, very much so. Very much so. Um, and I'll also just remind folks, if you have any questions as we're moving along, certainly um, go ahead and add them in the chat and we'll make sure um, that we get those questions answered by either myself or Melanie. So um, Melanie, my next question for you is, can you tell us a little bit about uh, the concept of reverse mentorship and how organizations can engage with their teams and have success using this particular approach? Yes, I love the idea of reverse mentorship, and I think not enough organizations are considering it. And it's exactly what it sounds like. We often think of mentorship as somebody more senior or often older who is passing down wisdom to somebody more junior, when actually when we think about a lot of the challenges that leaders are facing today, it requires understanding a younger and or more junior perspective. And that can be because there are new technologies, that's the most cliched version, but it can also simply be because more junior staff are closer to the line. They have a better ear to the ground, not just in terms of what's going on with staff and engagement, but often even what's going on with the customer. And so I love seeing, you know, it's not a lot, but more and more companies, and this is a big feature um, in, in the case study in my book, uh, organizations that are saying, we need to figure out how to make mentorship work both ways so that leaders have these formal mechanisms for getting feedback and points of view below them. Yeah, um, I've actually had experience with a reverse mentorship program that um, I oversaw. And mm. I think it was extremely helpful for that senior leader to really understand some of the generational thoughts mm -hmm. and perspectives um, that, you know, younger folks in the workforce can bring. I also think that it could be used as a cultural tool. So, mm -hmm. you know, a person from one ethnic background really coming to learn about another uh, ethnic or demographic background is really a form of, of mentorship that can happen mm -hmm. as well. So um, I, I think it's a tool that uh, really is probably underutilized today, but certainly could be an answer to starting to um, overcome some of those generational, um, gender, um, demographic issues and biases that, um, you know, we might face, particularly those who are leading organizations to really understand what um, those individuals who are part of those groups are experiencing. 
I, I love that. It can be sideways too, that sideways, yeah. upward, downwards. It's really just about someone making themselves vulnerable to learn from someone whose perspective is different from theirs. That's right. That's right. So what is the best piece of advice you've received that has really helped you be a stronger leader? And, and after you answer that question, what would you share as a piece of advice for others? Oh, so many, so many pieces of advice I, that I've learned from over the years. You know, when I was, when I was really young, I would watch my dad talk on the phone. Um, he was a scientist. And, but whenever I, I heard him in professional conversations, he always uh, would start by asking the person what their headache was at the moment. And I remember when he'd interview for jobs, he would tell me that the first question he would ask or, or the maybe the last, whenever they let him, he would ask about yes. the person's headache. And what he explained to me was that everybody, no matter who they are, they have headaches and migraines and they're different from yours. And that the key to any kind of influence, whether you're leading up, down or below uh, or sideways is to understand, you know, where is the other person coming from? What's, what's their headache and how can you help with that? Yeah, I, I think that's a very wise uh, piece of advice to give because it also opens up sort of this empathy response, right? Mm -hmm. I actually care about what is um, causing you anxiety or causing you stress um, and how I might be able to help with that. So I think that's a really great question um, to, to ask when you're in interview process. Um, speaking of questions, we actually have uh, one from our audience. What have been some of your greatest lessons learned throughout your career? Oh, that's another one. Um, how long do we have? <laughs> <laughs> I think a lot of it, this maybe gets to the headache part too. A lot of my greatest lessons as I've advanced in my career have especially been related to the role that you know, psychology plays. Mm -hmm. And that in the end, human beings are very, very busy people. <laughs> um, you know, we're all kind of overwhelmed by to-do lists that are too long, both professional and personal. And so as much as we want to change and want to do the right things and want the kind of transformation that our organizations need, either strategically or culturally or organizationally, there are just all of these psychological cognitive biases that are kind of getting in our way. Um, we don't have time to do our chair because, you know, how are we going to get our to-do list done? And it's yeah. any kind of change leads to fear. And so I think I've increasingly realized the importance of being honest about emotions and their role at work and what the role that fear and guilt and shame and defensiveness play, um, you know, whether it's related to equity issues where these emotions play a big role, but actually for anything. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that's, that's critically important. And I often talk about being able to bring your whole self to work. I mm -hmm. mean, we can't just drop off a bag of emotions that don't suit us when we come into the workplace, right? We, we bring those things with us. Um, and, and being able to understand how to have positive outlets to express those emotions, have people that you trust in the workplace, mm -hmm. I think is really critical to how you survive it. Um, and I'll share one of the best pieces of, of advice that I could probably give is to be yourself. But being your authentic self is mm -hmm. probably the hardest thing, yet the best thing that you can do for your career. Because once mm -hmm. you figure out who you are, no one can stop you from doing and being your best authentic self. Mm -hmm. And to know, and if, if there's a job where being your authentic self isn't working, then maybe that's not the right job. Exactly. It, 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 that's exactly right. Because being yourself may mean that you don't fit in that environment that you're currently in. There's a better environment suited mm -hmm. to to your skills, your talents, your passion that you bring. Mm -hmm. Very yeah, important. Absolutely. Um, we have another question that came in from the audience, which is for our younger audience members today, what advice can you give to deal with that fear? And I think this is... Um, uh, related back to how you answered the first question. Mm -hmm. I think a lot of it is, first of all, acknowledging it, that it's okay, that it's perfectly normal. I think what happens is that a 
a lot of women in particular and people of color in particular, but everybody uh, can be subject to imposter syndrome, right? Can be subject to the questioning ourselves and the self doubt and the fear that comes with it. And that's perfectly normal. And so uh, part of it is just being in a culture that acknowledges that fear is okay. And then to start to question where does that emotion come from? Uh, do I have that fear because I think I won't succeed? Well, what's the worst that could happen? I have yes. a, um, I won't do this justice, but on my um, one of the episodes of my podcast, I think it's the one titled uh, Mental Matter, uh, my friend, uh, Dr. Hong Depp, she's a psychologist, and she talks about how with her clients, she works with them through cognitive behavioral therapy on looking at imposter syndrome and looking at internalized bias and really questioning the thoughts behind it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I, sometimes I think it is about running to that fear because mm -hmm. oftentimes what we think is going to happen is much worse than what actually happens. And so yeah. if you <laughs> move yourself through it, um, you will be okay on the other side, even if you happen to make a mistake or fail, right? You pick yourself up, you keep going, you learn from that experience. So fear actually can help us in certain instances. I, I love that you said that about accepting that failure is actually a part of life and a part of growth. And that if we're not failing, that means we're probably not growing and not stretching ourselves. And uh, one of my colleagues, Megan Adams, um, one of my former colleagues, always talks about how we celebrate successes, but we need to start celebrating failures as well as a way to just start acculturating folks to the fact that that's normal and that's good. Yes. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, so there are two books I'm going to recommend right now. One is called The Leadership Pipeline, and I'm not remembering the authors, but it actually goes through across any career from an individual contributor to a manager to a manager of managers and so on as you advance the ladder. How is it that what got you here won't get you there? So what are at kind of predictable points in an organization uh, and in on a, a career ladder? Are there completely new skills that people need to develop? So I first of all recommend the leadership pipeline because I think there's not enough um, just honest conversation about the fact that different levels require different skills. And then another book I'll recommend is called Own the Room. And it talks about va balancing voice for self and voice for others and how most people tend towards one or the other and the trick as a leader is to figure out where you are now and which of those you need to work on and how awesome thank you melanie for uh, continuing that while i had a brief hiatus all right so i want to uh to thank everybody for their time today but particularly melanie and to let you all know that you can find more out about her work uh, by visiting melaniho.com. That's melaniho.com. And thank you to the audience today. Um, I hope that you're able to join us for our next session, which is on Wednesday, May the 26th at 12 p.m. Eastern. Um, and that dialogue is going to be with Bert Blitch, uh, who is the CEO and founder of a company called Patient Co. And we'll be discussing how to create a culture of belonging within a high growth health technology organization. Do you know somebody who uh, would be good for chat with the chief? Nominate them to join us uh, by sending us an email at info at justhealthcollective.com. And again, thank you to our guest, Melanie Ho. We really hope that uh, this conversation was beneficial for you. Thanks so much for having me.